Let's pray together. Now, Father, if we're honest, we'll admit that we have moments of doubt. And so here is the story before us of a man who doubted in what Jesus said to get him back on track. And I pray for anyone that's struggling with doubt that you will turn that doubt into an even deeper belief. So we commit this time of Bible study to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you have ever struggled with doubt? Raise your hand up. You've struggled with doubt. Okay. How many of you have never had a doubt since you become a Christian about anything that you believe? Raise your hand up. Oh, I'm glad no one did because I was going to tell you you're an idiot. <laughs> because doubt is not necessarily a sign that a man or a woman is wrong. It's a sign that they're thinking. They're thinking. You know, sometimes parents freak out when their kids start pushing back. When your son or your daughter, whom you've raised in the church and taken to Sunday school, comes up and actually questions if the Bible really is the Word of God. They question if Jesus really is the only way. Oh no, what have I done wrong? You've done nothing wrong. The child is simply learning to think for themselves. These are things we need to learn to do. But there are times in life, even as mature believers, when things don't make sense. Maybe something happened and you had to scratch your head and ask the question, where was God in all of this? Or maybe you were praying about something and God just seemed to be silent. All he would have to do is just speak a word and your problem would have been resolved. Or he could have done something to fix your situation. It seemed to you as though God were sitting on his hands or is intentionally dragging his feet or maybe is not even paying attention. And this has caused you to momentarily entertain doubt. It's been said, quote, when the warm, moist air of our expectations collide with the icy cold of God's silence, inevitably clouds of doubt begin to form. And then when you doubt, you feel as though you're some kind of a spiritual failure or you've gone apostate. I just want you to know, if you've had moments of doubt, you're not the only one. It may surprise you to know that the greatest of the Old Testament prophets had moments of doubt. His name, John the Baptist. And this is his story. We're going to see why he doubted, and we're going to see what Jesus said to deal with that doubt. Now, in fairness to John, Maybe what he was experiencing could be better described as perplexity or confusion. He just didn't quite get what was happening. And Jesus shared some words with him that helped him to refocus again. So let's read the story, Matthew 11, starting in verse 1. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison, about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to Jesus, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, you go tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised and the poor of the gospel preach to them and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. As he departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before me. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has never risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. We'll stop there. Now, maybe it's hard for us to understand how significant John was in his day. You need to recognize that it had been 400 years since Israel had heard from a prophet. From the death of Malachi to John's birth, Israel had not effectively heard a message from heaven for 400 years. They had this string of prophets up to Malachi and then this sort of icy silence from heaven. No angels, no miracles, no messages, nothing. And then suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, but right on God's 
timetable, emerges this colorful character, John the Baptist. No fancy robes like the Pharisees. He was a hardcore outdoorsman. He wore camouflage head to toe. Not really, but he would have if he were here today. He was dressed in animal skins. He ate locusts and wild honey. They had never seen anyone like John before. And he offered hope to the people, calling them back to God. And at the same time, he fearlessly called out the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. In Matthew 3, verse 7, we read that when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be baptized, he denounced them and said, You brood of snakes! Who warned you to flee God's coming judgment? Prove by the way that you live that you've turned from your sins and you've turned to God. Don't say, oh, we're safe. We're descendants of Abraham. That proves nothing. God can change these stones into children of Abraham. Wow. That's a sure way to get yourself into trouble because these religious leaders were influential. They were powerful. And John calls them out as a brood of snakes. Well, the people loved them. John was like a rock star. It's interesting that the ancient historian Josephus wrote more about the life and ministry of John than he did about Jesus Christ. So I bring this up to simply point out that John was a famous, powerful preacher and prophet to the people. And indeed he was spoken of uh, in the scripture, he was prophesied just as surely as Christ was. In fact, in our message this Sunday, as we sort of follow the Christmas story chronologically, we're going to see how the Lord came to John's parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and told them they would have this child named John. His job was to prepare the way of the Lord. John had three objectives set before him. To clear the way, to prepare the way, and to get out of the way. So while he was on the scene, he was the man getting things ready for Jesus. And then there he was at the Jordan River, sort of his base of operations where he would baptize people. And one day Jesus Christ shows up and says, John, I want you to baptize me. John says, listen, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals, much less baptize you. But indeed the Lord told him to baptize him. And John witnessed with his own eyes the Holy Spirit descend upon Christ in the form of a dove and the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But that pretty much meant that John's ministry was now completed. Overnight, he walked away from his huge ministry because mission completed. And he said to his disciples, hey guys, check it out. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His disciples would now be the disciples of the Lord Jesus. Don't follow me anymore, guys. Go follow him. My job is completed. His job was to prepare the way, and now that job is done. And this outdoorsman, this man who was so full of energy and action, is placed in a dungeon. Now, you have to understand, when we're talking a dungeon, we're talking the, the worst-case scenario. Uh, this is and not to say that our prisons or jail cells are, are a pleasant place to spend time, but comparatively, they would be like a luxury room. He was effectively in a hole with other men. There would be no place, uh, no sanitation facility, shall we say, to put it delicately. Rats would have been biting at his feet. The, the portions would have been meager. The water would have been polluted. You can't imagine a worse stench and this is where the great outdoorsman used to be under the blue sky was now placed. How did he get there? Well, <laughs> old John, you know, he just couldn't keep his opinions to himself. And he called out a powerful man known as King Herod. You see, King Herod married a woman named Herodias. And the whole relationship was illegitimate. Uh, history tells us she was married to Herod's brother Philip. And not only that, she was a daughter of <clears throat> Aristobal. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but Aristobulus, I think, another half-brother of Herod, making her Herod's niece. So Herod married his niece. He left his wife to marry his niece. Now that would sound normal today, but back in this day it was scandalous. <laughs> <clears throat> so John called him out on it. He said, this is sinful. This is wrong before God. Herod said, okay, I'm throwing you in a dungeon. And there he was, waiting. 
And he was waiting for some good news because Jesus now has started his ministry and John's waiting to hear about the revolt. You see, John, like most people of this day, had a misunderstanding of the role of the Messiah. Let me put it a different way. They had a partial understanding of the role of the Messiah. They thought when Messiah arrived, he would overthrow the tyranny of the day, which in their case was Rome. He was waiting to hear that Rome is defeated. Christ has established his kingdom. The Messiah is here. But 18 months have passed and nothing has happened. No revolt has been organized. And then to make matters worse, word on the street was Jesus was eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors. So here's John in a hellhole, in a dungeon, waiting for Messiah to establish his kingdom. And here's Christ out having a good time in John's eyes. He didn't understand how this fit into God's plan. And he began to doubt, wondering, did, did I get this wrong somehow? Am I missing something? I mean, is this not the Messiah? And does not Isaiah 61 say of the Messiah that he's going to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor? Well, the prisoners haven't been released. None of these things has ha have happened, but here was John's problem. He was seeing things incorrectly, and he was seeing them in sort of a B.C. way. I don't mean before Christ. I mean before Calvary. See, here's what they missed, and we can see it now clearly, but they failed to see that before Messiah would establish his kingdom, and by the way, that's still yet to come, he would come and suffer for the sins of of the world. Before wearing many crowns, Messiah would wear the crown of thorns. Before the throne would come the cross. And after the cross and the resurrection, they understood. But largely not before. And I don't think we should be too quick to criticize because we've misunderstood God as well. Uh, we've thought maybe God was doing a certain thing that he was not doing. Or we don't understand why he did a certain thing. When tragedy hits the life of a godly man or woman, we wonder why. When a child dies or a loved one gets cancer, we ask, why did God do this to me? Or God do this to them? You see, the problem is we interpret God in light of the tragedy instead of the other way around. Don't interpret God in the light of your tragedy. Interpret your tragedy in the light of God and remembering that God's in control, that God loves you, that God can work all things together for good for those of us who have been called by him. So John is crying out and he's saying, Lord, why haven't you saved me? Why am I in this place still? No, it's not a bad thing to have moments of doubt. Sometimes we need to go to the foyer of doubt to get into the sanctuary of certainty. Let me repeat that. Sometimes we have to go through the foyer or foyer, depending on your pronunciation, of doubt before you enter the sanctuary of certainty. A French proverb says, quote, he who knows nothing doubts nothing, end quote. Another said, doubt is not the opposite of faith. It's an element of faith. So it means you're processing. You're working it out. You're coming to understand it. And there were other Men of God who doubted as well. How about Moses, who was ready to quit on more than one occasion? And in the book of Numbers, after listening to the Israel's whine, he said to God, I'm not able to bear these people alone. The burden is too heavy. If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me. How's that for a guy having a little bit of a crisis of faith? Or Elijah, after his great bout with the prophets of Baal up in Mount Carmel upon hearing that Jezebel wanted him dead he just went into a little cave and said God just take my life I don't want to live anymore even the apostle Paul was discouraged he wrote in 2 Corinthians 1 8 we were burdened beyond measure above strength so we despaired even of life so if you've had moments of doubt, if you've had moments of discouragement, if things are making sense to you, you're not alone. You're not the only one. The old country preacher, Vance Havner, said of John, quote, here in the dungeon of doubt, John fell into despair and depression. 
The men who could reprove kings and call religious people snakes can also get down in the dumps just like you and I. It's one thing to stand on the Jordan and give it. It's another thing to sit in jail and take it. End quote. So that's John having his moment of discouragement. He wasn't asking for information as much as he was looking for confirmation. Did I miss something here? Did I get this right? Is there something that uh, has not been made clear to me? And uh, now we're gonna see what the Lord did to help him. But let me contrast for a moment doubt and unbelief because I think sometimes we confuse it too. Uh, doubt and unbelief are very different. Doubt is a matter of the mind. We don't understand what God is doing or why he is doing it. While unbelief is a matter of the will. It's when we refuse to believe God's word and obey what he tells us to do. See, if I have a doubt, that may mean I'm just waiting for further information. Uh, we like to call Thomas the doubter. And you remember he was given that title because after Christ appeared to the disciples in the upper room and he wasn't there, and they told him, he said, Psh, right. And by the way, in the original language, Psh, is implied. No, not really. Um, <laughs> it's a hard word to translate. Psh, you know that word? That sound, I should say. But he effectively said, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. If I can put my hand in the wound in his side and touch the wounds in his hands, then I'll believe. But the next time the disciples met, Thomas was there. And who shows up? Christ. And he says, hey, Thomas, loose paraphrase, go for it, buddy. Here I am. Thomas is like, I'm good. <laughs> he just says, my Lord and my God. Now listen, in defense of Thomas, he didn't ask for any more than what the other disciples had experienced. He wasn't gonna believe something just because someone told him it was true. He wanted to know for himself and there's nothing wrong with that. When presented with the evidence, the doubter turns into the believer. That's doubt. Belief, that's a choice. Belief is saying, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I choose to not believe it. I reject what you're saying altogether. So that's not what John was. He was not a non-believer, far from it. He was a very committed believer, but he had his moment of doubt. But let's notice what he did with his doubt. He called out to Jesus. You see, this was before you could send a text. You could have texted Christ. Hey, Jesus, what's up? Send him an email. Call him. No. He's sitting in a dungeon. He sends word. And just ask Jesus this one question. Are you the one? Or should we look for another? But here's the point. Who did he send the message to? Jesus. So what should we do with our doubts? Go to Jesus. Don't go away from Jesus. Go to him. Bring your doubts. Bring your questions to the Lord. That is the mark of a true believer. And all of the calamities that befell dear old Job, including the loss of his possessions and health, and worst of all, his children. We read him say these words in Job 121. Naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked will I depart. The Lord gives, the Lord is taken away. The name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. A great commentator named G. Campbell Morgan uh, had this observation about John, and I quote, he says, men of faith are always the men who have to confront problems. For if you believe in God, you will sometimes wonder why he allows certain things to happen. But keep in mind there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Like Habakkuk, the doubter questions God and may even debate God, but the doubter doesn't abandon God. But unbelief is rebellion against God. It's a refusal to accept what he says and does. Unbelief is an act of the will while doubt is born out of a troubled mind and a broken heart, end quote. Very well put. That's what John had, a troubled mind and a broken heart. So here he is calling out to the Lord. Again, remember, he's in a dungeon. So he says, send this word to Jesus. Here's a response of our Lord, Matthew 11, look at verse four. Jesus answered and said, you go tell John the things you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The dead are raised and the poor of the gospel preach to them. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now Christ is referring to Old Testament prophecies 
pertaining to the role of the Messiah, which John would immediately recognize. Jesus is alluding to Isaiah 35, 5, and also Isaiah 61. Now I want you to notice how Christ reacted to the doubt of John. In answering these messengers, Jesus did not say, how dare John doubt me? My own cousin, he should have known better. But here's the point. God never rebukes anyone who comes to him with sincere questions or honest doubts. And so what does Jesus do? He turns John back to scripture and then says in verse six, blessed is he who is not offended because of me, or literally the person who's not hurt or resentful or annoyed or repelled or made to stumble, whatever may occur. Here's what Christ is saying. Listen, you just let old John know this. Uh, John, even if you don't understand my method, even if you don't grasp my ways or my timing, I'm asking you to trust me. And when, it, when you're unable to see why I'm doing what I am doing or why I'm not doing what you think I ought to be doing, I'm just saying, hang in there. Follow me. Don't be offended because of this. I mean, how would you feel if someone that you loved and trusted uh, began to question you? You might say, Psh, you know, there's that word again, or that sound. <laughs> Two times in one sermon. I'd have just called this sermon, Psh. <laughs> How would you spell that, P-S-S-S-T? I'm not sure. But if someone doubts you or questions you, you may want to diss them. Oh yeah, well, what do they know? You know, John, come on, give me a break. You all know he was a little strange, right? I mean, the animal skins. Who eats locusts? <laughs> that was my cousin. Maybe there's something in this diet. Good opportunity to throw someone under the bus. Did Jesus do that? Not at all. He did the very opposite. He used it as an opportunity to speak of the greatness of John. See, our Lord understood this was an attack of the enemy. He understood what loneliness and solitude can do. Jesus understood John might be a little bit impatient. But Jesus said, let me tell you something about John. <laughs> what did you go out in the wilderness to see? Some lightweight? Some guy dressed in fine clothing? I'm telling you, of those born of women, there has never been a greater than John the Baptist. Wow, what a commendation. He's saying effectively, he's the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And so I want you to send that back to him. You tell him I said this. Tell him I say he's the best of the prophets. You tell him I love him. And you tell him everything's on schedule. And you tell him he is not wrong in believing I'm the Messiah. Everything is going as it should. And this reminds us it doesn't really matter when it's all said and done what others think about us as Christians. What matters is what Jesus thinks about us. Now this amazing statement, verse 11, of those born among women, there's no one greater than John. Why is John the greatest? Did John ever write a, a book like we do, like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel? No, he doesn't even have a small book uh, like Malachi. Uh, no, he wrote no book of the Bible. Well, did John ever perform a miracle like turning the Nile River into blood like Moses or calling fire down from heaven like Elijah? No, he didn't do that either. Did he ever raise the dead? No, he never did. So why is John the greatest of the Old Testament prophets? Here's the answer. Because he and he alone was the direct herald and forerunner of Jesus. His greatness was a direct result of his nearness and connection to Jesus. His story is in the New Testament, but effectively his life and ministry are of the Old Testament system. For the New Testament system did not really begin until Jesus inaugurated it and fulfilled the old with his death and resurrection. So John was sort of the last of the Mohicans, if you will. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets, but he was the most significant because he was the one that pointed people to Christ. And then the Lord says in verse 11, but he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know, we can by the fact maybe that John was the greatest of the prophets, but how is it possible that those of us who are merely Christians, uh, even those of us who may not be well-known Christians, least in the kingdom, 
would be greater than John. Well, here's why. Here's why. <laughs> that was a Bob Coy quote. John was a part of the Old Testament economy. You are a New Testament believer. John was a herald of the king. You're a friend of the king. John was a friend of the bridegroom. You're the bride of the bridegroom. John lived and died on the other side of the cross, resurrection and ascension of Christ. We live in the new covenant with Jesus now and in dwelling inside of us. So how did Jesus deal with John's doubts? You might want to write these things down in case you're struggling with doubt. Number one, he refocused his priorities. He refocused his priorities. John had unbiblical and unrealistic expectations of the ministry, purpose, and timing of Jesus. He didn't understand that Jesus had to suffer and die before he established his kingdom. So it's not that John was asking too much. In fact, he was asking too little. He was expecting a political kingdom, a material kingdom. But Jesus had something different in mind. Number two, Jesus used the scripture to bring John back to what really mattered. He referred John back to the prophecies of the Messiah and Isaiah, reminding him of what the Bible said. And this reminds us of the story of the two disciples walking on, on the Emmaus Road. This is after Christ was crucified and, and they didn't understand he was going to rise again from the dead, so our Lord joins them. I talked about this last Sunday. And uh, Jesus listens to them for a while. And then he reveals to them all of those passages in the Old Testament that spoke of the coming Messiah. And here's the key. He did it with the Bible. He opened the scripture to them. And then they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he walked with us on the way? And I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you immerse yourself in the Bible. <laughs> When you're in time, a time of pain, when you're in a time of perplexity, when you're facing doubt, get into the Word of God. That's the antidote. Uh, just fill your mind with God's Word. Memorize God's Word. Think about God's Word. Quote God's Word. That's the way to deal with it. That's what the Lord did. He brought John back to Scripture. You need to believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. Let me repeat that. Believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. Number three, he kept right on with his purpose and asked John to not be stumbled or annoyed. Again, Christ kept right on with his purpose and asked John not to be stumbled or annoyed. In other words, he said, John, you're gonna have to trust me on this one, buddy. I know it's not making sense right now, but it will in time. You'll see, kind of like when our kids ask us, why they can't do something, and we say, because I said so. Kids hate that, don't they? But why? Because I said so. I hate that! Then one day, you become a parent and find yourself saying the same thing. And sometimes the Lord, we ask the Lord if we can have a certain thing or do a certain thing, and God says no. And we say, but why? God says, because I said so. And one day you'll know why I said so. And John, of course, would know in time and we will know in time. Right now we don't see everything clearly. The Bible says we see through a glass darkly, but then we will see face to face. Or from the Greek it could be translated, now we only see in a fragmentary fashion, but one day I will be fully known, or rather I will fully know as I am fully known. So I know you have questions. Listen, I have plenty of questions that I'll ask God, but I kind of think when I get to heaven, I'll probably just drop them. I think once I look into the face of Jesus, I'll go, never mind. <laughs> this is good. And then I'll say this, Psst. no, I won't say that. <laughs> It'd be the last thing I'd say. I just wanted to get that three times in one sermon. <laughs> well, realize in that final day when we stand before God, he never sat on his hands. But in fact, those hands were nailed to a cross. And we'll understand why he did or why he did not do what we wanted him to do. Until that day, we have to trust and follow. 
So yes, John was a part of the Old Testament covenant, the last of those great prophets. The old covenant that said that we approach God through the animal sacrifices offered by the priest in the Holy of Holies once a year where you symbolically take your sins and they're placed on the animal like the sacrificial lamb. But John had it exactly right when he said to his disciples pointing to Christ, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus would fulfill all of those types pointed to in the Old Covenant when he died on the cross. And in light of that, our Lord has asked us to do something for him. He wants us to remember. And that brings us to the communion table. I want to read some words from the Apostle Paul out of 1 Corinthians 11. You're welcome to read along with me if you would like. But these are the words that Paul gives us about how we are to approach communion or the Lord's Supper as it's sometimes called. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do, and as often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy way will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Communion. Why do we have this? Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. The Lord has established this beautiful time when we come back and revisit in our hearts and in our minds what happened at the cross. I guess the Lord wants us to remember, no matter how much we've matured spiritually or how many good works we've done, that it still comes back to the cross. You know, the only reason I can approach God tonight is the same reason I could have approached, I would approach him right after I was converted because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I don't have greater access to God because I'm a preacher or because I uh, teach a Bible study. I come to him like everybody else comes to him. Uh, We all come through the cross. And Jesus wants us to remember that. He don't want us to get too big for our britches. And remember, it's all because of his sacrifice. But this is important also because there are times when you've sinned and you've failed and you say, well, I'm not worthy to approach God. Hate to break this to you. You were never worthy even on your best day. So this has nothing to do with worthiness. Don't let the devil lie to you and keep you from the cross. You know, when you sin, the Holy Spirit will convict you and bring you to the cross, but the devil will condemn you and try to drive you from the cross. So whenever you sin, you go as quickly as you can to the cross. You say, what does that mean? It means you come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I failed, I'm a sinner. Thank you that you shed your blood and atoned for my sin, and I turn from it now, and I turn to you again. That's what it means to come back to the cross. And so... As I come to the communion table, I'm told that this is something I should do continuously. A communion, the Lord's Supper, should be observed on a regular basis by the church. We come back to it again and again. Also, I would add that in the original language, the term affectionate is implied. So Jesus says, do this in affectionate remembrance of me. Though we are remembering a horrible event, the death of our Lord. We are also to come with a certain affection and even a joy, saying, Lord, thank you so much for all that you did for us. But then we are to not do so in an unworthy manner. Now understand, that doesn't say you have to be worthy to receive communion because no one's worthy, but don't do it in an unworthy manner. Paul says in verse 27, if you eat this bread or drink this cup, 
in an unworthy manner, you'll be guilty in body, a guilty of the body and blood of our Lord. So what this means is to do it in a cavalier way, in, in a reverent way, in a flippant way. We don't believe in transubstantiation here at Harvest. In other words, we don't believe that the crackers that came from the supermarket <laughs> turn into the body of our Lord, nor do we believe that this grape juice turns into the blood of our Lord. That's transubstantiation. We don't believe that. We don't believe these are holy elements here, but we believe they represent one who is holy. So when I hold that little bit of bread unleavened and I have that little cup, it symbolizes the holy son of God that shed his blood for me on the cross of Calvary. So as I'm preparing to receive communion, I need to just like think about what I'm doing, right? I don't need to be thinking, oh gee, where shall I go eat afterwards? I'm thinking in and out burger. Then again, maybe we'll go to Chick-fil-A or, oh no, let's go to Pinkberry. Or are these just my thoughts? <laughs> or, oh, did I leave the iron on? Or, oh, that's a cute outfit. Oh, they look awful. Oh, you know, or, you know, you know, I'm talking about trivial thoughts that we all have, right? Not this lady here, but everybody else. <laughs> we have those trivial thoughts. Sort of push those out of your mind right now. Don't think those things. Think about Jesus. Think about the cross. Think about his suffering. Well, Greg, I wasn't there. Yeah, I wasn't either. But we have a pretty graphic account on the Gospels, don't we? I think we all know this story pretty well. Think about him suffering. Think about him bearing the sin of the world. Think about him bearing your sin as you receive that bread, of you, as you drink of the cup. Don't receive it in an unworthy manner. You know, sometimes I think a non-believer may visit church and see communion as being served and think, oh, cool, I'm gonna do this because this little ritual will, you know, buy me some credit with God. You know, some people, they're so warped in their thinking. They believe that if they go to church or a couple of services, that they've kind of earned credit now to sin more. Oh, I can go out and do more awful stuff because after all, I did all this extra stuff for God. Man, don't think that way. And I think the main thing we want to remember is that the worst thing you could do is receive these elements and not be a Christian. These things will not draw you closer to God. In fact, I would say to you, they could actually bring judgment on you. It's almost like mocking God to receive the elements of communion without believing in the one they represent. Communion is for believers only. Remember those jackets you used to wear a long time ago for members only? How many of you wore one of those? How many of you have continued to wear one since then? <laughs> what were we members of exactly? <laughs> for members only. Members of what? We're not sure. But it's only for members. They were ugly too, those jackets, weren't they? I had one. Because I was a member of nothing. Well, communion is for believers only. Only believers. So here's my question to you in closing. Are you a believer? You say, well, I believe there's a God. No, I didn't ask that. That could be someone who acknowledges something. But a believer is one who has put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ to be their Savior and Lord. And it means that you've asked Christ to come and live inside of you and you're following him. And if you've not done that yet, I'd love to lead you in a prayer right now before we receive communion, an opportunity for you to believe in him. Now don't put this off to another day. You need to do this today because you never know when your last day will come. Tomorrow, we remember the tragic assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas. And uh, some of you were old enough to have been alive when that happened. I was. I was 11 years old. And uh, everyone remembers where they were when they heard the news, right? And it was so unexpected. You know, it's, that day started out as such a happy day, really, with the adoring throngs uh, cheering the motorcade as the president so handsome and young, uh, seated next to his beautiful wife in her pink Chanel outfit, complete with pillbox hat, you know. Who would have ever thought that an assassin's bullet 
would take the life of our president, but it did. And it was like a national trauma. Everybody experienced it in real time. And even now as you watch those old grainy films, some of you who are younger may have a hard time understanding how radical that event was to all of America. But uh, when President Kennedy, uh, he was the president-elect, but he had not yet taken the oath, uh, he went out golfing with Billy Graham, who's been a chaplain to all of the presidents, going back to President Eisenhower. And uh, so President Kennedy had some questions for Billy. And he said to Billy, uh, do you believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ? And Billy said, well, I certainly do. And then President Kennedy asked him, well, what does my church teach? Do they believe it? And Billy responded, well, they have it in their creeds. And the president-elect said, well, they don't preach it. They don't tell me much about it. I'd like to know what you think. And so Billy Graham shared the gospel with Kennedy. And after that, Kennedy said to him, well, I would like to know more about this on another day. And uh, on, shortly before the assassination took place, uh, Billy had a strong sense of foreboding. I actually talked to Billy about this personally because he knew Kennedy, and as I said. And he said he just had this sense that the president should not go to Dallas. So he sent a message uh, to Kennedy through a mutual friend and said, don't go to Dallas. And I don't think it's because Billy thought he was going to die. He just had a sense that it, something bad was going to happen, but he wasn't sure what. I don't think the president ever received that message, and we know the rest of the story. But, you know, little did this man know, riding in that motorcade, that this would be the last day of his life. But he had said to the Billy, well, or to Billy, one day we'll talk about that, you know, and I don't know if they ever had that conversation. But listen, well, we never know when that day is going to come. Don't, don't deal with this someday. Today's the day. Now's the time, because you don't know when life will end. And you need to be ready to meet God, because we're going to stand before him. And the question will be, what did you do with Jesus Christ? So before we come to this communion table, if you've not made that commitment to follow Christ, make it now. Make it today. Not someday, today. And more to the point, tonight. Let's all bow our heads. Father, I pray for any that have joined us who may not yet know you, Lord, would you help them to see their need for Jesus and help them to turn from their sin and believe in you now. We commit them to you. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together, how many of you would say tonight, Greg, I'm ready to believe in Jesus now. I want my sin forgiven. I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven. I want to get right with God. I don't want to wait for someday. I want to do it today. I want to do it right now tonight. Pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that you will go to heaven when you die, would you lift your hand up wherever you are and let me pray for you right now. If you want Christ to come into your life, lift your hand up. I'll pray for you now. Just lift your hand up. You want his forgiveness. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? You want to know that you'll go to heaven when you die. You want Jesus Christ to come into your life. Lift your hand up. I'll pray for you. Wherever you are. God bless each one of you that have raised your hand. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. If you haven't lifted it yet, lift it now in this final moment. Let me pray for you. God bless each one of you. Now, I'm going to ask God bless you too. And God bless you as well. God bless you. I'm going to ask all of you that have raised your hand, if you would please, Pray this prayer after me right where you're sitting. Again, as I pray, pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross for my sin. And I'm sorry for it. And I turn from it. And I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be my God and my friend. Thank you for calling me and accepting me, and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you that prayed that prayer. Amen.